Well, it's lovely to be uh, with you this morning and to have the opportunity to be with you again this evening. Uh, we do bring the greetings of uh, Bethel Clinic to you, and uh, it's uh, good to share fellowship with you uh, in this way uh, this morning. And the passage that we read um, earlier in the service uh, took place on the very first Palm Sunday, uh, the week before Easter. Uh, and it's that time where we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So if you're trying to place the story into context, that's where um, it fits. And of course, as we think about that time, it's amazing that uh, in the space of a week, really, uh, Jesus went from being welcomed as a hero as he entered Jerusalem to being crucified on a cross. But then I guess Jesus has always divided opinion. Uh, he's not like other religious leaders. And therefore, Christianity is not like other religions either. Uh, at least the genuine Christianity that Jesus preached is not like other religions. There's something different about true biblical Christianity. Uh, so when Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem the week before he was crucified, Jesus did something unexpected. Jesus made enemies of the powerful. He made friends with the vulnerable. You see, Jesus wasn't interested in power and prestige. Uh, as the Bible puts it elsewhere, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So as we look at what happened when Jesus entered Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, we'll see Jesus as he really was, a champion of the needy, an opponent of the self-serving. And as we look at Jesus in this light, we'll be able to see how those who recognize their own need of him will find delight and peace even today. But we'll only do that when we realize that most of us, perhaps for most of our lives, have misunderstood the story that we read together, the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. Uh, you see, uh, we often think of this story of, uh, of being about corrupt high priests trying to make a quick buck renting out table space to money changes and to people selling sacrifices. And there's some truth in that, but that's not the whole truth. And it's only when we discover the whole truth about this section that we'll realize uh, really why Jesus came to earth and what he came to do. So there's three things uh, that I want to uh, help us to learn from this passage. And the first one is this. We're excluded from God's presence. We're excluded from God's presence. Now, I need to be honest with you and say that this point is not directly in the text. Now, that's very naughty for a preacher. Preachers should always make sure that the points that they bring to a congregation are in the text and we can defend them and support them from what the Bible says. Well, I can do that from what the Bible says, but not directly from this text. But that is okay in this case. This is the exception that proves the rule because every Jewish person growing up would know that we're excluded from God's presence. And Matthew, writing his gospel primarily for Jewish people, didn't need to put that explicitly in the text because everybody knew it. And they knew it not only from their upbringing, but they knew it because of the place this story takes place in from the temple court or the temple area, I think the Bible version we read this morning said. So Jesus turning over the, te over the tables in the, in the temple area, the temple courtyard, is now a famous scene. We've kind of got used to it. It's part of how we understand Jesus. But of course, it shocked people in Jesus' day that anyone would do this. The temple, of course, had been established by God for the good of the people. It's where you went to worship God. But by Jesus' day, the chief priests who were running the temple were part of an aristocratic elite family. Their dedication to the people was questionable at best. Their dedication to God was equally questionable. You see, the chief priests, to remain in power, offered sacrifices not only to God, but they also offered sacrifices every day to the Roman emperor. The high priests themselves were very wealthy people. 
Uh, the priesthood was passed down a little bit like a kingship might be passed down from father to son very often. Uh, taking on the high priest, you see, was a dangerous game because the high priests have the backing of Rome and of the empire. Now, if we're to visualize what it would have been like for Jesus to come into that setting and turn over these tables, we need to think again about the place where this took place, the temple itself. What was that like? Well, the temple complex was like a series of onion layers, with each layer being considered as more holy than the previous layer. So the, the outermost layer, the skin on the onion, if I can put it like that, is called the court of the Gentiles. Now this part of the temple is the least holy, and the chief priest says, well, anyone can come into this area, the court of the Gentiles. It was a huge, vast area. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people could fit inside this court of the Gentiles. It didn't have a roof or anything, it was all outdoors. And that's where the market tables that Jesus turned over had been set up. Now, inside the court of the Gentiles, much smaller, is another courtyard. Now, again, this doesn't have a, a roof over it. Uh, this courtyard is called the women's courtyard. And this is immediately in front of the temple building itself. So if you imagine uh, that my iPad here is the, uh, the court of the Gentiles, obviously a lot bigger in practice, then the women's courtyard would be about this sort of size. And then the temple building itself would be smaller than the end of my finger on this scale. That's the sort of scale that we're talking about. So the women's courtyard is tiny in comparison with the court of the Gentiles. And it's named by the chief priests for a group of people that the chief priests consider to be more holy than the Gentiles, the women. But uh, despite the name, it doesn't mean that only women can go there. That's not why it's called the Court of Women. It's called the Court of Women because that's as far as women were allowed to go. They couldn't go any further. Uh, even Jewish women were not allowed beyond the Court of Women women. Now, very helpfully, of course, uh, the temple authorities wanted to make sure to place the offering boxes inside this court. Uh, so uh, uh, they didn't want their denigration of women to reduce their income. Uh, so this court of women, that's the place where the widow would have put her two mites. Now, the chief priests considered men to be more holy than women. Now, just to be very clear about this, this is another example of the chief priests running the temple in a way contrary to what God had intended. So this, this layer of the temple, inside the layer, um, the courtyard of women, was called the courtyard of Israel. And into that courtyard, Jewish men could go, and only Jewish men. And we're really getting close now to the temple building itself, but we're still not inside the temple building, we're still outside, there's no roof, it's all open air. And of course, this courtyard of Israel, that's as far as Jesus and his disciples would ever have been able to go. So think about this, when Jesus was here on earth, he never went inside the temple building. He only got as far as the temple courtyards. Okay, one of the inner courtyards, admittedly, but nonetheless, still a courtyard. Now, within the court of Israel, there was another courtyard. And this courtyard was set off from the court of Israel by a kind of low bar bar balustrade, a little fence, in other words. And on the other side of the fence, or the balustrade, was the next layer of holiness. And this part of the courtyard was now within touching distance of the temple. And this was called the court of priests. The altar was in the court of the priests, 
But of course, ordinary people were forbidden to go there. So just to recap, and I appreciate this is complex, this, this onion, we've got the court of the Gentiles, the big one on the outside, the court of women within that, the court of Israel, then the court of priests, and finally, at this point, we're within touching distance of the temple building itself. <clears throat> now remember, up until this point, all of the people that we described, the Gentiles, the women, the ordinary Israelites, the ordinary priests, none of them so far have got to go inside the temple building. Out of the millions of ordinary Jewish people that there have been whilst that temple stood, the vast majority, 99.99 something percent, never made it inside the temple building. But the temple building is the fifth layer in our series of onions. And we're finally inside the building, and this building, this part of the building, is now called the holy place. There's another altar inside the holy place, and some of the important temple furniture, the golden candlestick, the table of bread, that sort of thing, uh, are there inside the building. Now, only priests can go into the building, but not all priests. There were thousands of priests who were serving the temple. It's a big operation. And out of those thousands of priests who were serving in the temple complex, we think from historical records that about six each day could go inside the temple building, inside the holy place. And you won't be surprised to know that most of the people with that privilege were the high priests, the chief priests. So the vast majority of priests who served in Israel would go through their entire priestly careers never having entered the holy place. It was normal for a priest not to get there. It was abnormal, special, to be allowed in. Do you remember Zechariah, John the Baptist's father? Uh, he had been chosen to burn incense in the temple. He was an old man. And he'd finally made it into the holy place for the first time in his life. And we know it was the first time in his life because it was considered to be such a privilege for a priest to go into the holy place that once they'd made it in, they would be ineligible for selection ever again. So what used to happen was, was this with the priests. Uh, different priests from all over Israel would take in turns to come from their village down to Jerusalem to serve for a week in the temple. And every day, out of those thousands of people that came down, one would be chosen by lot to go into the temple for that day. And it happened to be Zechariah in the providence of God on the day that the angel came. And once that had happened, you never got a lot ever again. Now, even at this point, where a tiny percentage of priests are allowed to go, there's still yet another layer of the onion. And that, of course, is the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is separated from the holy place by this great veil or curtain. And it was inside the Holy of Holies that God was said to dwell. And we've talked about how difficult it was to get into the holy place, how few people made that, do you know what it is, how, to, how you get into the most holy place or the holy of holies? Well, out of all of the people in the whole world, one person was allowed into the holy place, the most holy of holies, and only then once a year. That's how holy the holy of holies was. And even then, you'd have to go through certain sacrifices and cleansings, and on the Day of Atonement, the high priest himself could go in. So, I hope you're building up a picture that would have been familiar to every first century Jew, and we've perhaps got a vague idea of, but I hope that the vague idea has become a little bit clearer for all of us, of all of these barriers that there are between the people and the place where God is said to dwell in the middle of the temple. Five barriers. Uh, I, I don't know our ethnic makeup here, but I would imagine most of us would have got as far as the court of the Gentiles and no further. The court of women would have been barred to most, if not all of us here um, this morning. 
Even if we'd have made it as far as the court of women, there's another barrier before we get to the court of Israel, another barrier before we get to the court of priests, another barrier before we get to the holy place, and yet another barrier before we get to the most holy of holies. And at each barrier, fewer and fewer people are eligible to go. Until at the end, it's one person, once a year, who can get to the place where God is said to dwell. Now, <clears throat> I've said already a, a couple of times that sometimes the chief priests went further than God did, for example, in excluding women. But the basic principle of there being levels of holiness and barriers that stopped people crossing those levels, that principle is very clearly there for us in the Old Testament. God made very clear that because of his holiness, Access to God could only be obtained by a select few holy people. The Bible's super clear about that. They had to offer sacrifices. They had to go through cleansing rituals. To ordinary people like us, the direct way to God was barred throughout all of the Old Testament period, up to and including the period where Jesus walked this earth. That's the reality. Now, why did God do that? Why did God do that? Why did God stop people coming near to him? Well, as we've said, that holy of holies inside the temple, it represented heaven itself. Remember, it was the place where God was said to dwell. And the decorations and so on around would have been of angels and cherubim, that sort of thing, to really help people to understand this is like heaven. So if you wanted to get to heaven, you had a very good visualization of how to get there. A really powerful image. Heaven, if, if heaven was represented by the Holy of Holies, heaven was excluded to the Gentiles. Excluded to Jewish women. Excluded to Jewish men. Excluded to priests excluded even to chief priests and chosen priests, excluded even to the chief high priest himself, except on one occasion when atonement was made. So you understand hopefully now why my first heading in this sermon is we're excluded from God's presence because the temple itself showed the people that. What excluded us? And then, it was sin. Because what was needed to cross each of these barriers to the Holy of Holies was an offering, a cleansing. And the closer and closer you got to the Holy of Holies, the more costly the sacrifice. And by the time you finally get there, the only acceptable offering is a blood sacrifice, a life being taken a reminder that the wages of sin is death. So, we're excluded from God's presence. That's what we're learning. The second thing that I want to share with you this morning is more encouraging. Jesus gives us hope of God's presence. Jesus gives us hope of God's presence. And now, I don't have to point to the temple, I can point to the text. And we can get to Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. And we'll see there that Jesus gives us hope of God's presence. Verse 12, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So famous words of Jesus and, of course, a famous scene. But let's make sure we don't miss the point that Jesus is making. So as we said earlier, we, we often understand this passage as Jesus taking a swipe at the corrupt temple officials who've made the sacrificial system and offering to make a quick buck rather than as a place to meet with God. And there's a lot of truth in that. If that's what you've learned in Sunday school or taught to others in Sunday school, that's correct. That's true. You see, the money changing system wasn't originally designed as a revenue stream, but that is what it became. 
Uh, You see, the Bible included an instruction that the tabernacle, and then later the temple, should be funded by a, a relatively modest annual contribution from every Israelite. Uh, The idea from God was that everybody would contribute the same amount. So if you happen to be really rich, you wouldn't have any more sway or influence than somebody who was very poor. Because everybody giving a little would be enough for the temple to be funded. That's what God wanted, everybody to give a little. Now, by the time of Jesus' day, the temple authorities had decided that the usual currency in circulation at the time couldn't be used as an offering for God because the coin included a picture of the emperor on it. And the temple authorities decided that, well, you're not allowed graven images, and this coin has got a graven image on it, and therefore you can't put this coin in the temple offering. That's what they decided. But don't worry, they said, we've got a solution. We'll sell you a coin that doesn't have an engraved image on it. Aren't we kind? And of course, there's a markup on the coin. Now, the sacrificial animals kind of operated in a similar way. Not every animal could be sacrificed, the Bible said. God made it clear you need to bring the best animals to God. If you just bring rubbish, I won't accept that, God said. I paraphrase slightly, but you get the idea. And the chief priests exploited this. They would say something like this. "Uh, Mr. Israelite, how do you know that this lamb that you've brought, which you say is the best of your flock, how do you know that God will accept that? How do you know that your lamb is good enough. And Mr. Israelite would start to get a bit worried at this point and think, well, I don't really know. I know I'm supposed to bring the best, but I don't know how my lamb compares with everybody else's lamb. Don't worry, said the chief priests. I'll sell you a lamb which is guaranteed to be accepted by God. No need to drag your lamb all the way down from Galilee. Just turn up at the temple and we'll sell you a lamb that's guaranteed to be accepted by God. And the chief priest could make a lot of money renting out tables to people involved in this trade. And all the time, of course, they were hiding behind the pretense of offering an important service to the people. It's kind of how the temple operated. It was corrupt. So on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus voices what most people are thinking. He drives out the people selling pigeons for sacrifices. He overturns the tables of the money changers selling coins for offering. He's rightly angry at the corruption. He tells them that they're a den of robbers. Now, don't miss the symbolism in what Jesus is doing. Who is Jesus driving out of the temple? He's driving out the men who the priests say make it possible for your sacrifices to be accepted by God. If there's nowhere to exchange coins for the offering, how are the people going to make an offering to cross those barriers? If there's nowhere to buy pigeons for sacrifice, how are the people going to offer something for sin you see without this system how is anyone going to make it from the court of the gentiles to the court of women to the court of israelites never mind any further you see what jesus seems to be doing here is not only pointing out the corruption that's involved in these practices but he also seems to be hinting at the fact that these offerings will no longer be necessary in fact Jesus is doing much more than just hinting at that. Because Jesus quotes from the Bible to help us understand what he's up to. And the problem that we have, and maybe the reason why we haven't understood this as well as we might have done, is that most of us, when we read the New Testament, don't bother to to turn to the Old Testament to, to read the words that Jesus or Paul or whoever it is quotes in context. And when we do that, we'll often find Uh, some really helpful, what a surprise, uh, really helpful stuff in the Old Testament to help us understand the New Testament. So in this case, the den of robbers quote, 
is from Isaiah chapter 56. And in Isaiah uh, chapter 56, uh, we read there uh, something really quite remarkable. So, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 3, let's begin there. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Now remember, Jesus is doing all this in the court of the Gentiles, the court of the foreigners, the court, in other words, of the people who are excluded from God's presence because they can't go further than the court of the Gentiles. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 6. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So again, Jesus had said uh, back in uh, Isaiah 21, my house will be called a house of prayer. And Isaiah 56 is where that phrase comes from, the house of prayer. And it's spoken to Gentiles. It's spoken to people, Isaiah 56 verse 7, who God will bring to his holy mountain. Do you know where the holy mountain is? Mount Zion, Jerusalem. It's where the temple was built, right on top of the mountain. That's what Jesus is referring to here. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, Jesus is saying. You see, when Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, he's just using a, a, a short phrase, my house will be called a house of prayer. But when we go back and read that phrase in context, we find that this is all about a house of prayer for everyone. Not just for the high priests, not just for the ordinary priests, not just for the Israelite men, not just for the Israelite women, but for the Gentiles too, for everybody. Uh, in fact, we're told that these people are going to minister to God, to be his servants, in other words. And we discover, uh, that's uh, uh, 56 verse 6, we discover as we go through uh, the Bible that that word serve is most often used of priests serving God. It's a priestly word. Isaiah 56 is hinting that Gentiles are going to be becoming priests to minister and serve to God. So Jesus is furious not just because the elite priests are ripping off the peasants. Jesus is furious because God is in the process of throwing open the doors to the temple, to his presence, and the priesthood keep closing the doors. Now, to any Gentiles, therefore, who have come to worship God, why else would they be in the court of the Gentiles? Any Gentiles who have come to worship God who might be listening in, they're probably fairly familiar with Isaiah 56 because that's a chapter that speaks to them. And if they catch then Jesus' reference to Isaiah 56, what a revolutionary thought. Is this the time where Isaiah 56 is finally going to come into fruition? Is this the time when foreigners are going to be able to serve God and to love him? Is this the time when they're going to be able to come to the holy mountain and to offer burnt offer offerings and sacrifices to be accepted? Is this the time? That's what the Gentiles are going to be thinking, those who understand uh, the context. And that's why I believe Jesus quotes from Isaiah 56 here in this passage. Now, of course, Jesus' message is not just for the Gentile crowd. And there will be quite a crowd, won't they, around these fallen tables and escaped pigeons. Uh, Jesus' message is for us too. He's giving hope to the Gentiles. It is now the time? But he's giving us hope too. Because we're Gentiles for the most part, I would imagine. He's giving us hope that even those whose sin has excluded them from God might soon be able to be welcomed into God's presence. There is hope of God's presence, Jesus is saying. 
And that brings us to the final uh, lesson for us from Matthew 21 this morning. We've seen that we're excluded from God's presence. We've seen that Jesus gives us hope of God's presence. Thirdly and finally, I want to show you that Jesus opens the way to God's presence. Jesus opens the way to God's presence. You see, Jesus was doing much more here than just bringing hope. He was bringing hope that maybe the door would get opened. He was doing more than that. He was opening the door. Verses 14 through to 16 now. Uh, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple. My pages have stuck together. Just give me a second. The blind and the lame uh, came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the, pages and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouted in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Now, it wasn't just Gentiles that the chief priests excluded from God's presence. The chief priests also excluded the blind and the lame from those inner temple courts. If you were somebody who was blind or lame, even if you were an Israelite, you couldn't go into the court of women or the court of Israel. Uh, do you remember, for example, the lame man who Peter and John met? Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way who asked for arms and held out his palms. you remember that? Where was he? At the gate. Why is he at the gate? Because he can't go in. He can't go in. Now, there was nothing in the Bible to command this. But in this system of increasing levels of holiness, the chief priests seem to have decided that the blind and the lame were not worthy to come any closer to God's presence. Their physical imperfections kept them out, according to the chief priests. And the chief priests wrongly linked the physical imperfections with sin. And the chief priests interpreted the blindness and the lameness of the consequences of some kind of hidden or secret sin. Do you remember when Jesus met the blind man, the disciples even asked, well, who is it that sinned? Was it this man or was it his parents? An assumption, you see, that because there was a physical problem, that pointed to a spiritual problem. And Jesus said, no. But nonetheless, that's what happened with the chief priests. So the blind and the lame that come to Jesus, they're stuck in the court of the Gentiles. They can't get any further. They're excluded. And these excluded outcast people came to Jesus when he turned over the tables and as he set the pigeons free. Uh, maybe the lame guided the blind and the blind supported the lame. But somehow through the commotion, they made it to Jesus. So what did Jesus do for these outcast excluded people? Matthew puts it incredibly simply, doesn't he? What does he say? He says, he healed them. He healed them. End of verse 14. And in healing them, Jesus wasn't simply giving them a fresh start in life. He was doing something much more important. What was he doing? He was removing the barrier to entry. Nothing could now stop these formerly blind and formerly lame men now going through the gates into the court of women. And if they were men, from there into the court of Israel. Those that were formerly excluded were now included. And Jesus did this. He didn't just give them hope that one day he would do it. He did it right there, right then. He miraculously brought about the change that was necessary for these lame and blind people to be accepted and to cross the barrier. And in doing so, he's given the crowds and the chief priests a very strong hint of why he'd come to Jerusalem and to this earth. He was opening the way. He was breaking down the barrier. 
And the chief priests, verse 15, were predictably furious. Not just by what Jesus had done, hard to be furious when a blind man can see, even though they tried pretty hard. Furious not just by what Jesus had done, but what was said about him. What was said about him. Hosanna to the son of David. That had been cried out by the te- children now, there in the temple area. Hosanna to the son of David. Now, son of David is a messianic term. In other words, it's a term used in the Old Testament to talk about the promised one of God who will come to rescue his people from their sins. Hosanna was shouted by the children and by the earlier crowd as Jesus entered Jerusalem. It means this. It means, save us. Save us. Now, in the form that it's used here in Matthew chapter 21, Hosanna is mentioned only once in the Old Testament. Psalm 118, verse 25. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Yahweh, the name of God. O Lord, we pray, give us success. It's the same Psalm, 118, that a few verses earlier said that the stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. A reminder that Jesus' rejection by priestly authorities, the stone the builders rejected, was not an accident, but a fulfillment of prophecy. These words that the children speak point us to Old Testament prophecy too. But a few verses before uh, that phrase, we read this, Psalm 118, verses 19 and 21. Let me uh, find that and read it to you. Psalm 118, verses 19 and 21. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then the very next verse, verse 25, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now, whether the children or the crowd knew it, they're explaining to all of us what Jesus came to do. He came to open the gates of heaven that all might go in. He's come that he might become our salvation. That's what the children are pointing us to. But but what about Jesus? What does he point us to? Well, he quotes from the Old Testament again, doesn't he? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. What are we going to do now? We're going to turn to Psalm 8, because that's where that phrase comes from. And Psalm 8 is a, uh, verse 2 of Psalm 8 is where that phrase comes from. Verse, Psalm 8 is a, is a short psalm, but it includes this phrase. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. What's Psalm 8 all about? Psalm 8 is all about Jesus. All about the Messiah. All about the promised one who came. That's what Psalm 8 is all about. And that's what Jesus is pointing us to. You see, if we put this all together, we see that as Jesus entered Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday... He did so by visiting the temple courts. And that temple with all those different courts and holy places was a picture of a people cut off from God. But it was also a reminder that God would not be cut off forever. Because when the high priest went into the holy place, he went in as a representative of his people. The whole purpose of these elaborate levels of access was to show the people that despite their sin, despite all of these barriers, there was a way into God's presence by one person, by God's chosen high priest offering atonement. The temple ceremonies showed, yes, that we were cut off from God, but also that we could come to God through a chosen representative. The problem, of course, was that those who claimed to be God's representative on earth were corrupt. They were dens of robbers. How are these guys going to help you, Jesus says? Look at their corruption. Those who were supposed to bring salvation were themselves in need of salvation. So in the temple courts, Jesus is surrounded by people who need saving. The chief priests need saving, though they'd never admit it. The Gentiles need saving, and they know it. 
The blind and the lame need saving. They know it too. They know they're excluded. So what does Jesus do? He exposes the hypocrisy of the self-righteous and he gives hope to the humble. He destroys those man-made means of becoming right with God, the pre-approved sacrifices, the marked-up coins, and he declares the temple to be open, open to the Gentiles, open to those who are far off. And he doesn't just say it, he does it. He doesn't just tell them that the doors are open. He breaks down the doors by healing the blind and the lame and removing that which barred them from the inner temple courts. And all of that points to his mission and purpose, why he's come to Jerusalem, why he's come to earth from heaven. Now, it's still a picture, of course. It's not yet Good Friday in Matthew 21. But the reality behind the picture is that Jesus has come to open the door, not the door of the temple, but the door to heaven. The reality to which the temple points. He's come not just to heal the blind and the lame. He's come to forgive sinners. He's come not just, just, not just to dismantle the tables of money changers. But to render redundant the entire sacrificial system. By offering himself once for all for the sins of his people. And he's come not just to pass judgment on the corrupt high priest. But to become God's high priest. Making atonement for his people. What a radical message in his day and in ours. He is the only name under heaven by which men and women can be saved. And the blind understood something of that. The lame understood something of that. The children understood something of that. The lowest in society in Jesus' day, in other words. The humble, they understood. The powerful, the proud, they didn't get it. They just saw somebody to oppose. You see, it's only by bowing the knee in humility and confession and acceptance that we can receive the great offer of Jesus. Have you done that? Have you cried out, Hosanna, save us? If you've not yet done that, now is the time to come into the presence of God and see those barriers broken down for you too. Let's pray briefly before we sing. Father in heaven, we thank you for these words of Scripture. We thank you for the way in which Scripture weaves together to teach us of all that Jesus came to do. And we thank you for the wonderful way in which Jesus broke down those barriers for the blind and the lame, that they might go in. And many of us here this morning, Lord, can say, Thank you, Lord Jesus, that that's what you did for us. You broke down the barrier, healed our sin, that we might come in. And the very fact that we are praying right now to our Heavenly Father in His presence is a testament to the life and death of Jesus Christ, breaking down these barriers for us. Father God, we pray, if there are people here this morning, or maybe watching or listening later, who are still barred. Oh, Father God, help them to see only Jesus can save and help them to cry out as the children did, Hosanna, save us, Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.